Lion Farm, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, yeah. What I do is uh, pretty much I like to look into some of the said in the Bible about basically the historical movements of the biblical Israelites and find out where they are today and looking into basically the genetic, the historic, the linguistic and different information all around to try to come to a clear picture of what's going on in the world we're in. Cool. So tell me what evidence you think there is, or tell me more generally, what do you think is the position of the Hebrew Israelites and what is the evidence that supports that position? Yeah. So one of the biggest things about when we think about things like people see Hebrew Israelism or the black Hebrew Israelites or Hebrew Israelites or people who claim to be of Israelite descent, or even if we're going to say like something as simple as a Jew or Jewish. So there's a, there's a line from a genetic and someone claiming a birthright versus someone who is basically of faith or of a, a religion. Now, what I'm more reflecting when I say ancient is a historical and a more genetic base um, group of individuals. And I believe that we do have evidence for that in a couple different um, articles that actually look into some of the PCA studies and some of the Y chromosome and MDNA of the Jews or who are claimed are Jews or some of the movements or places of Jews that are found. And I think we have a couple of those. Well, what are you comparing it to? So like, um, I imagine the claim is something like uh, the original Hebrews or something that are mentioned from the Bible went to Africa or something. And that seems to be like the conclusion you're making. And there's some some tribe that you're referring to. And so if that's the case. Yeah, well, let's look at the beginning. Like, for example, when we're talking about the people who are like genetic Israelites, we're talking about descendants that will come from them that left the Euphrates, uh, areas of Euphrates, and he would have went down Syria, down the Levant, into areas of Africa, into Egypt. Now, his descendants, they would have kind of made a back and forth movement through Syria and Africa, back to Egypt. So it's important to know, like, they're going from Syria to, to Africa, Egypt. And then within a hundred, hundreds of hundreds of years, the descendants of the growth of these Basically, he has 12 sons from a certain woman named Sarah. And those 12 sons, long story short, to Egypt. They have hundreds of hundreds of years of generations development in those areas of Africa, Egypt. They're also being sent down the Nile. We know this because there are certain verses of scripture that talk about when those Israelites are in Egypt, they're also being sent down the Nile. Now, there are different scholarly consensus of where that was. Some say it was in Thebes. If we're taking like, it depends if we're talking about new kingdom or, you know, the changes of Egypt, because a lot of people, they differ between either if the ex Exodus was in the 1500s or if the Exodus was in the 1200s, which I more point to what they call um, a late Exodus or some say an early Exodus. Does, it depends on what, what their view of that is. But me personally, I find that we know that the Israelites were people that existed. They had popped up after the movements of pretty much some of the Semitic groups that went into the lands of Egypt. Um, from my studies, a land called Avaris. So within the area of Avaris, there were Israelites, but then at a certain time frame, they would left. Now, a lot of people say different things about who was the Exodus Pharaoh, but I believe that that Exodus Pharaoh was Ramses II. That is another subject to get into, but the most important thing is that by the time when the Israelites had went into the Levant, which we see are mentioned in tablets like the Merneth, the Stili, they actually were seen to be there for a while into different events like the Bible talks about. They were taken captive, they were going to the land for a while, and then they were going back and forth through Egypt. Like, for example, one of the time of the kings, Solomon, and his basically um, rival, in a way, um, Jeroboam, 
there was a separation where Rehoboam was going to become the next king and Jeroboam was going to be king of the northern tribes. But that was a time they went into Egypt. So when Solomon was ruling, some of the Israelites went into Egypt again to Africa. Now, it was also interesting to note at that time that the Egyptians, the rulers were moving into areas of Libya and stuff. So we also know that some of the earliest evidence of synagogues in Africa were, were in Africa. For example, one of the synagogues um, within 1000 BC in Libya, we have a lot of evidence of ancient Israelite uh, presence in, in time frame. And we also have evidence of them in the Middle Ages by certain documents and certain writings. And I think that's what's the most important thing is to look at the historical movement. As we know, the Israelites were real people, but the question is, which way did they they go in their exit in their exiles? So, could you be more specific about like when do you think there was somebody in Israel who you think moved down to Africa, and when did this happen? Who was it? What was the time period? And uh, what specifically is your position, so we can try to understand it better? Okay, can you hear me? All right, I'm going to kind of. No, I can't hear you. I think you lost connection. How are you guys in the chat doing? Hey, Don, how's it going? Uh, Michael, Squid, Super Hunk from, from the Twitch chat. Appreciate the Twitch followers. Don't have, we got like five people who follow on there. What's a mower? Hmm. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, were you able to hear me? Because on my phone, I don't know if I if I sc switch screens, if you can hear me or not. Uh, no, you lost connection, so I couldn't hear you when you did that. Okay, okay. Um, I'll basically explain what, what I was explaining, because I guess I can't switch screens. I'm going to use another screen while I'm explaining. Um, basically, okay. the, the explanation is we actually know that in the writings of Jeremiah 40, we know that... that during the Babylonian exiles, we know that Nebuchadnezzar had basically persecuted the people for a while. And by the time of basically 586 BC, we know that Israelites were going down into Egypt. Now, even in the book of Jeremiah and in other writings of the early, um, uh, early Testament, we know that as Israelites were going down into Egypt, they were fleeing more deeper into Africa. And they were being persecuted a little later. And there was a prophecy of a 40 year captivity that was going to happen when they go into Egypt. So they knew that it was going to happen. And as more went deeper and deeper in the time of, you know, you could say about 2,500 years ago, right? Or 2,600 years ago, around that time, people started to go into the lands of Egypt. Now, I wanted to do this on my computer, but my boys had taken my charger. So my computer is dead. <laughs> but I wanted to read something, uh, a, a, a genetic article that actually talks about the study of Mizraim Jews with Jews of Iraq. And they found out a study of their PCA. They have a deep ancestral connection to some of the Yoruba Bantu groups. And we're talking 2,600 years ago that the PCA is showing that these groups are connected to some of these African groups, that these African groups actually show even genetic connections up to 3,200 years ago in some of the ancient Jews that are said to be um, banished to areas of um, 
pretty much lands of media and Babylon, which is really interesting because when you take some of the studies, we're talking not obviously take these things as a grain of salt. That's why I take hours on my channel. We take hours looking into the actual genetic results and studies. And we find out that early Jews did show that they had a ancestral connection to said groups that would be considered African. So what I'm, what, what I'm discussing is basically this African admixture was early in the Jews. Sure. Why is that surprising? Like any group usually has genetic mixtures with every other group around it to some degree. So why is that surprising? Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the point is that why is that surprising? But the point is a lot of people, when you see studies of Jews now, for example, the Ashkenazim, which is a middle age culture mix, which if we go back to the bottleneck during 1,200 years ago, they had an Indo-European mix. Well, that was the largest growing population of Jews, but they had this new modern Indo-European mix. And also we know that during that time, there was a mass conversion that had happened. But the problem is that the original ancient Jews originally ha had an African admixture, not a recent African admixture, but an ancient African admixture. But the recent Jews have a middle age Indo-European mixture. So the interesting thing is that the ancient Jews may have been more of that African um, component first and later had received some of that Indo-European admixture. Well, we're all from Africa. Like the, the further you go back, the more African everybody becomes because we're all from Africa. Well, a majority from looking at fossils, when we're considering we're all from Africa, what are you talking about? Specifically, are you saying that we all root to an African atom, or are you saying that our Hablo groups would trace to Africa? Because, for example, if your Hablo group is I, a Hablo group of I, you've never been to Africa, right? If we're talking about from your node, right, from your from the clay, all the clay of I would have been in Europe, right? We could trace that all the way back to like the recent bottleneck in the Neolithic or the banishment of the Arctic humans, like the, or archaic humans, like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, right? So when we're talking about modern humans, we're talking about a separation of basically the node that splits into different clades. And these clades are all separate into almost a different family stock from what we can see from what is called a star graph or unrooted chart, right? So from the root, all lines diverge, and we find evidence, just like how we see in the Bible, there was a global mass extinction and a genetic bottleneck, showing that all men would trace to one node, to one, one ultimate male line, which wouldn't, which, not, which wouldn't actually be Adam, but would be a genetic CT. Or you can look it up, it's, a, it's called a genetic CT, or the haplogroup CT, which is a root node that makes all the lineages afterwards. So yeah, we would technically, yes, if we go all the way deep into ancient roots, we, have, we all would link to one ultimate man. But when I'm talking modern humans, as all humans today are modern humans, right? We're talking about a genetic selection that was made of a certain group. I, I don't see what... Uh... I don't see this like the significance of what you're saying and how it's different from just what we already believe about genetics in Israel and Africa and how they're related. I don't see what what is the importance of saying that yes, there is genetic lineages where the people passed genes in different groups nearby, therefore what? What I'm saying is just like when the scripture says, out of all the the heritage of the world, out of all the heritage of Adam, God chose Israel. And we know that because there's a there's a verse in Genesis that says out of all all the her all the all the heritages, right? He said he chose Israel. And the reason why that's important, the reason why that's important, is because out of Israel will come the rising of a later Messiah that will save the whole world. Now, the illustration of that was because we had to first go through the historical understanding of who is Israel and why the world needs to be saved. Because if we look at ancient culture, 
there's no doubt that like even the Tufian culture that showed that they went down into Africa and started to pretty much torment even pregnant women and stuff like that. We're talking ancient Mesolithic, Paleolithic culture, cultures of ancient humans that were tormenting people. And since the since the time, the dawn of ancient ancient um, humans, right? Neanderthals, the Sovans, they've been killing each other for a long time. Modern humans, ancient humans, Wait, it's just, all just types to, of humans. Just to like um, rephrase what you said. So the reason it matters is because the Israelites were chosen by God. And so one of the descendants of the Israelites is supposed to be the Messiah. And therefore it's important to know which lineages are descendants of Israel to guess which ones the Messiah could potentially come from. Is that essentially it? Well, the the great thing is that we don't ha- it don't we don't have to go through that complex process now because for us to find out now yeah we have to use tools like historical connections genetic connections right but one of the best things that we can use is ancient history is that when the Israelites were rising they were rising up around the areas of Levant and areas of Africa where we know Egypt was and of areas of Babylon. So we know that they was all around the Middle East, around that area. But what happened was, is that God chose a people that he was going to illustrate how he wanted people to be, how they want, he wanted them to be structured people. But he knew that as people are, they will constantly show these constant flaws. So the scripture, it writes almost like a biography of the witness of life. Like we can, we can verify almost every king every ruler in the Bible in their exact time living and in many times addressing certain kings like certain kings like Jehu and certain kings of the northern tribes that are verified by other kings in well, actual I'm pretty, stealers. I'm pretty familiar with the Bible. The first confirmed king is David. Everyone before that is not confirmed. But more interested in like specifically you're claiming that God picked a people and when did he pick his people? What was the what is the date? And then all of the people who are in that group from that date have a lineage. We're talking we Bronze Age, a Bronze Age bronze culture. Age. That's what we're talking about. Bronze Age culture. So the Bronze Age Israelites, or the Bronze Age, bronze Age Hebrews, all of their descendants would be of this particular lineage, right? Yeah. So when a certain male was selected, a certain, and now this was interesting. This is why we got to look at Y chromosome, because it was a certain male. That was selected. Now, this means that this male, his line already existed, but he was selected. His name was Abraham, and he was selected, and it was said that from his descendants would rise a descendant that would actually many people. Now, the story is that as the story progressed all the way to the Iron Age, right, the time of the kings, until the time of the transition to the Middle Age, when Christ comes in. So Christ comes in, obviously, at the transition when we see AD, BC time frame. And, or some people say, you know, BC's CE time frame. He comes in, right? And he's the fulfillment to many other sayings of old. But we have to understand what he, what he even says, right? In Luke, he illustrates that the, because the people rejected him, is that as we know, the Messiah had to come to the temple. One of the prophecies of old said the temple had to stand there, which we know historically the temple was there before 70 AD. Messiah, and we know Christians were there before 70 AD. And we know that Messiah prophesied that the pe- people was going to go into captivity into all nations again. Now, we know that many people went to captivity in all nations. But the interesting thing is, is the illustration of the people chosen that would be the people of God that would be sent into captivity of, of all the nations. The reason why that's important is because he also prophesied of a gathering of them in Acts 1, 6, and 7, where he says that the Father will gather them in a time to come. And it's interesting because all of Christ are waiting for a time to come. But he also leaves the people, the ancient people, almost on a suspense that they are also waiting for a time to come. But well, they're so, in so another almost- captivity trying to go like one step at a time here so you're saying that the true israelites the ones chosen by god are all the ones the lineage of abraham the other the other hebrews at the time don't count it's only the lineage of abraham and so the significant group that you're trying to identify is all of the descendants of abraham that exist today all of those are the true israelites right 
Yeah, so what I'm what I'm discussing, what I'm saying is that the descendants of the bloodline of Abraham, of his direct like bloodline descendants, would be from a certain Y chromosome group, which I think right. would actually and those be are, more. And those are the true Israelites. That's what you're looking for. The true Israelites yes. are all the direct lineage of Abraham. Yes, and and there would also be a mixed multitude that would also take part later in the time of Egypt during the, the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, there will also be a mixed multitude during the exodus that becomes with them. And, and the, there's a law in the Bible that says um, that the Edomite and the Egyptian in the third generation will become one with them. So who would not be um, a true Israelite at this point? So given that, that the Bronze Age is 3000 BC to like 1000 BC, so that's like 5,000 years ago-ish. And if Abraham existed then, and if I don't think he did, I think he's a mythical character, but if he existed and had children and there was some kind of a, a lineage that was formed, kind of like Genghis Khan or Attila the Hunter or whatever, that lineage would span a large portion of the planet. Like it would go into Africa and it would go into Europe and it would go into India. And like there would be a huge population that would be related to, to this guy. So I, I imagine about a quarter of the world would be related to this guy at this point. Um, a time frame. You got to be careful of the time frame when he does, like he doesn't go into Europe. None of his lineage goes into Europe. No time um, before the Iron Age. That's one of the biggest things about his lineage. The, re the reason why we know that, because we can follow his lineage through the whole the scripture. He and his sons go to Syria and then they go down into the Levant. They go down into Egypt, Africa. They dwell in there for hundreds of years, right? Their descendants are, are are growing generations in Egypt, Africa for hundreds of years, right? Being also sent down the Nile, right? Being persecuted by the Egyptians for a while until they're to this where they some leave out and they dwell in the wilderness for a while and they dwell in areas of the Levant. So the time that you're thinking about when they go into Europe, you're thinking like after the bronze, like after Iron Age, like we're talking, you know, this is why we, we more relate them to more groups of Africa because they're going into Egypt and they're going to areas of Arabia, which is going to go connect Yemen and um, Abyssinia and stuff like that, where more Shemites were also in those areas, but not, not areas of like Finland and Europe and Turkestan and stuff like that. That's, that would be more of some of the later invaders of like sea people and stuff like that. That's why it's important to be careful when comparing who are the bloodline Israelites. They're going to be more of groups who we find as Yap lineages, of those Y lineages, of E lineages. We can find those in, our, in people like the Arameans, right? Semitic groups that I settled over there, or ancient Semitic groups, proto Semitic groups like Natufians that has settled in the Levant, or groups like different ones that settled around uh, Egypt. Because we know that certain men like Joseph, they got with Egyptians. Um, he had two sons. They were the lineages that grew up in the transition at the Bronze Age into the Iron Age called Ephraim Manasseh, also sons of Benjamin who were Jews. They also became parts with those women who were Egyptians. So a large portion of Egypt became part with the Israelites. So they would have darker tone because of many mixtures. For example, even Moses, who was of like the tribe of, of Levi, which was a close tribe of the Jews. And that is something that's important to know that he got with a Cushite, which was of the darker tribes. And that's something that we know that many of the Israelites, as we know, makes sense that they had the African mixture, even recent African mixture, even that mixture exactly at their development is that they would be a group that looking at historically and genetically, they would be more of a middle Southern um, area of the Levant and higher African culture. And that group that we see also sometimes going into areas of Africa have genetic ties to those groups. So what I'm saying is, yes, a large portion does have connections to Israelites, but I'm telling you that who, who they are, they have an ancient African origin. So that's what's important, is that I'm not saying every African is Israelites, but I'm telling you that there was a African tablo group that came into Africa 
and replace some of the groups in Africa. So that's what's important to know about is that E group that replaces those ancient A and B groups. That, that E group is that group that pops up, and I'm talking E1B1A exactly, that pops up later after the Neolithic. So it rises in Neolithic Eurasia, pops up, going down into Africa, and then starts to take over the Bronze Age, Iron Age cultures. And that's what's important to note is that connection, how it moves and it, it goes about like that. Well, so my first question would be is there's a bunch of different groups of, of Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, the Shepardi Jews, the Mizrahi Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, the Indian Jews, and they all have different uh, Y DNA aspects that they come from different lineages that all spread in different directions um, from Israel. And you're saying right, that and that's why it's important to look at each and in, each individual Y chromosome directly from its ancient ancestral node. Well, so how do you tell which one is the correct one? We look at the node, we look at the ancient ancestral node. For example, ah, the ancient the ancient ancestral node. For example, um, let's say like my Hablo group. My Hablo group is R1B, right? Many people know it as an Indo-European line, right? Many people know it as an Indo-European line or things like that. But it also has ancient presence in Africa. And that's something that's important to know is like how ancient these lineages diverge and split and go into different areas. So it's looking at those ancient nodes and it takes time, yes. That's why a lot of our lives are hours of hours looking up genetic papers and the fossils and their movements to find that Bronze Age culture, which one was that node. Well, so so but my, what my we question is more, I have a more general question here. Like, so we know that there is a large lineage of Jews from the time period of the Bronze Age when Abraham was supposed to live. And uh, the true Jews could be any of these. How do you tell which group of which descendants? And I would guess all of them would be. I don't. I don't know why we'd limit it to one of them. But I'd we say, can limit them. I'll, I'll explain why we can limit it to one. It's about that Neolithic um, bottleneck. Now, if you know, in the Neolithic time, right? This is when Noah pops up. Noah pops up in a Neolithic culture, and what happens is there's a Neolithic bottleneck, which we know genetically there's a Neolithic bottleneck. This is important because many, many mammals in that time in the Neolithic go through a bottleneck and a, a massive extinction event, right? We can talk about events from the middle of the transition of the said events from the oldest and younger Dryas. We can also talk about the events of the Capic um, white event that had happened to many different animals and humans at that time that left all humans coming from, like I said, specific uh, node of BT and CT, which when we start looking at the, the, the split at that Neolithic time, what we notice is this. We notice that IJK, haplogroups of IJK are highly related. Haplogroups right. of GHIJK, so, so HIJK, and IJK is related. The reason why that's important is because they point to the same descendants of Japheth. So if we can, we can connect there's many different Hablo groups, but if we can start connect them wait, 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 monophylactically, wait, wait. So, so I, I agree. I agree with the the Neolithic bottleneck. That's the thing. I totally agree. Ninety nine point yeah. nine percent of all humans are the same because of this, because there's oh, very few lineages came from this. But that applies to like all humans. So this doesn't right. really narrow it down much. This this eliminates like the Eskimos. Uh, that's about it. But so I don't see how. So we go from the Neolithic. There's a very small bottleneck where most humans come from. I agree. And mm -hmm. this gets us to how we exclude certain Jews. How? Because none of the, all of the Jews have the same Neolithic bottleneck markers. I don't see like. Well, that's when it gets really interesting. So the, remember that study I was I was talking about. So the study that looked at the ancient uh, Mizrahi and Iraqi Jews, we know that a lot of the groups that basically became Jews now, we have to process that there were many proselytes that were converted Greeks and Persians that had converted to Judaism right before even the coming up of the Persians that converted some of the groups in Khazaria. Now, I'm not saying every of uh, the modern Jews are Khazars, but there are many Jews that are Khazars today that have merged with many of the groups. And, and what's important about that is that the, the groups that became Khazars was split originally from a group called Gog Turks. Now, what's important about that 
is that the groups Og Turks, some of them by religious standards, became many different branches of the Abrahamic religions. Now, if we remember, the Abrahamic religions started around uh, Arabia, but the Gog Turks came from Turkestan, Mongolia. So we're talking the Seljuk Turks, that from the Seljuk Turks rose the Ottoman Turks, and the Ottoman Turks became um, Islamic. And that's important because Islamic, many people think Islam, people of Islam are the Arabs, and they think that originally they would trace to Ishmael. So if someone was to be religiously Muslim, they would think they would also be in a sense of Ishmael. Now, also interesting is that the same branch of the Gog Turks settled in parts of Khazaria. And that what's important about that is that's why that group is called Khazars, named off of the land in the Arabia River in Khazaria. And that group converted in the seven in 780s to Judaism. And that group, and we know because by 900 AD, there was a man named um forgive me if I say his name wrong. Um I think it's John Aaron, John Ben Aaron, John son of Aaron, or Jason son of Aaron, something like that. Or no, Joseph son of Aaron, Joseph Ben Aaron, with Joseph Ben Aaron the Khazar. So I can make that that right, is that he actually had tried to basically bring out a paper to show if he was actually a Jew, but they end up finding out that they were actually from the line of Japhet. The interesting thing about that is because as they go through the process of those groups of the North, they talk about that this saying that's also spoken of in the Bible, that's also spoken of in history, these nations called Gog and Magog. And the reason why that's important, they say Gog and Magog, or Magog especially, would be of Japheth. And that's actually where they say that many of the groups from Mongolia, Mongolia, or Gog Turks, they actually would have been branches originally from Turkestan, which also, that's why looking at ancient Havlo groups in the Bronze Age, many of those Havlo groups that we can exclude from being Jews, if we find them in the Bronze Age, in areas of like Asia, far out like that, especially during the, the movements of the Israelites, we start to realize that there, there's a there's a major difference in who are the Israelites that developed in areas of Africa, Egypt, and also being sent down the Nile versus groups that be developed in European or Indo-European or Indo-Iranian nations that came later in that developed with those groups as proselytes and converts. That again, in, re in religious terms, they would be accepted as religious but as in an ancient original group that came from the Neolithic bottleneck, bottleneck of the Shemites until the growth of those late um, Hebrews. Because remember, Abraham was a Hebrew, and those Hebrews would come from a Semitic stock of Afro-Asiatic branches or Afro-Asiatic groups, which that's why I say after the Neolithic rise that Bronze Age, well, so, so, he will be so, what the, when you said that the Ashkenazi Jews are Khazars, that that seems cl clearly no, no, no. I didn't say I didn't say the Ashkenazi Jews are Khazars. I said many Jews are Khazars. That's what I'm saying. Many Jews today are Khazars. Not all Jews, okay. but many are. But Ashkenazis are the largest group of the Jews that developed the Havlo group of the Khazars. Like I too, I too is confirmed as a Havlo group of the Khazars. Are um, are what so, so the data I'm looking at right here says. Q, of the chromosomes in Ashkenazi Jews do indeed represent the vest the vestiges of the mysterious Khazars, then according to our data, this contribution was limited to either a single founder or a few closely related men and does not exceed 12% of present day Ashkenaziism. So it's 12% max. 12% times that by the millions of them. So that's important to know that that's why I'm saying they have the largest growth of those Khazars. Yes, they have portion of them, but not all of them are Khazars because actually a portion of them Actually, 35% of them connects to ancient Shemites, like e, e1, the E1B1B groups. That connects to ancient Shemites. Well, I'm, not, I'm not seeing how this eliminates Ashkenazi Jews from being the true descendants of Abraham or whatever, So, because they could be. No, I'm telling you that the portion that we just confirmed as Khazars can't be. Right, but that's right. only like twelve percent of Ashkenazi, so that doesn't that doesn't eliminate Ashkenazi Jews. Oh, of like course, I never said that none of the Ashkenazis are them. In fact, I just said. That in fact we did a genetic study that 
there are groups of Ashkenazis that are Jews. We found an Ashkenazi with Iwa B1A, and he is confirmed to be an Ashkenazi Jew. And that's important to understand that portions of the Jews, that's why we said that they had an African admixture, and that portions of the modern Jews have an Indo-European mixture. That's why, just like you said, yeah, 12%, like you said, have Khazar admixture. But guess what? The Jews that we know had went to groups like San Tome, right? Because there were Jews that were sent to areas of Africa, islands like San Tome e Principe, and those Jews don't have a Khazarian mixture. They don't have that Indo-European mixture. They're, yeah, the, ancient, the, Indo they're the ancient yes. Jews that were sent down into Africa. Yes. So before they started to mix with that gene group, they split up and went different directions. So yes, there's different groups of Jews. I agree. So. Yes. I, I, and that's the point is that the ancient Jews didn't get that Khazarian, that Khazarian mixture that came in the middle age, but the ancient Jews would be the ones that, that did that in the European mixture. Those who went into deeper into Africa and areas of Arabia before the later um, invasions of Levant, like the Turkish so, so Turkification not, not here. of the Levant. So the ancient Jews, ancient Jews existed, and the ancient Jews could have gone to Khazar and gotten some of that. Like they could have continued to multiply. But when, 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 when would that happen? What what time frame would that happen? Because uh, I just told no you, idea. there's a paper we confirmed that the African admixture goes thirty two thousand years ago, or even well. 3,200 3, 3, 3, 3, years ago, even 2,600 years ago. So where would they pick up a Khazarian admixture? No, only in the Middle Age, because every study tells us that that mixture of that Khazarian mixture is in the Middle Age. So that Indo-European admixture is a later mixture, not an ancient mixture. So that means the ancient mix mixture is the African admixture as we can find just like we see like, so, in so the can we, studies we find can you give me an argument premise premise conclusion that tries to like filter out all the things you're saying into like a brief argument of what you're trying to say because right now it just seems like a bunch of random facts about genetic data which like most of which is correct and doesn't make a difference to the argument like what what is the argument the the argument is that the conclusion is that a lot of people, when they look at Jews today, is that they think the original Jews would have looked like the Middle Age mixture that came in with some of the, the converts that, that converted. But rather what I'm saying is that the ancient Jews still look the same today, that they look almost like ancient people. They look African. And that even when they're sent into captivity to different areas, they still hold that African admixture. And a lot of them ha had, what, as we have seen later in the Middle Jew? Age, got an Indo-European mixture. What is an ancient Jew? How, how old is ancient an Jew? An ancient Jew is a Jew whose line would connect all the way to the Bronze Age culture of Egypt, of the, of the Israelites that developed in the areas of Egypt. So wouldn't they look like Egyptians? Yes, they, and the Egyptians looked at dark skin. They looked at very dark skin. And Egyptians also were mating with the, the Nubians. We know because certain kings during the time, like King Tut and his lineages, they were mixing with the, the Nubians. We, we know that they were having relations with the Nubians. For example, I was just doing a, a talk about the Hyksos and how during a later time, the Nubians became very close to the Egyptians, and we know well, that the Egyptians there were, there were also different gave skin colors. To, to Joseph. Egyptians, Egyptians had a spectrum of skin colors. They weren't black; they were white, black, and everything in between. Yeah, so, they had a. We we know they had a mixture, and that's the point. That's that's the most important thing is that the Egyptians mixed in later with Israel, but that's going to be a later mix. The original mix that we need to look at is the one that came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that would have developed from the Hebrews, because remember, Hebrew is from a Semitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic column. So that's gonna be important to note is that we need to find out where does Afro-Asiatic come from? Because Hebrew, again, Abraham is one group, one person from a lineage of those Afro-Asiatic groups. Wait, so where do you think Abraham was born? Well, he was born in Earth. Yeah, like wh where would that be today? 
So there's there's obviously a um, scholarly consensus on that. Some say Syria, some say areas near Babylon, right? I believe it's at the Euphrates. I, I'll just say it's at Euphrates. And the people who live there are more Middle Eastern, not black, right? Well, if you look at culture, for example, it depends if you look at ancient culture or modern culture. If you look at ancient culture of those areas, a lot of those groups were darker skinned. For example, in the areas of Sumeria, you had groups that were called black-headed people and things like that. And we also know that Natufians had went over there, which were also E1B1B groups. So that's important to understand that um, the Neolithic culture, especially Neolithic culture, had a large portion of those E-M96 lineages spreading throughout those areas. So we're talking early well, E lineages. Yeah, I'm not following those areas. your argument there. So like the, uh, the skin the point color is the, divide the, in humanity. The lineage developed in a Neolithic in that area. Is what I'm saying. Well, no, no. So, so I don't agree with your argument that people in that area were black. Like, no, they were the same color as Middle Easterns are today. Well, what are, what is your what is your humanity. what is your when you're saying black? What are you saying when you say black? Because when you when you say black, I'm referencing the Hablo group that you, that most people call black, which is the E Hablo group. A lot of people say E is, oh, African is black. So when you're saying black, are you saying a skin pigmentation or are you saying the yeah. E Hablo group? No, I'm using pigment, skin pigmentation here. So I think that Oh, well, Abraham... that's not a science. That's We know that skin, skin as a genetic definition is not a science, right? Oh. That's, that's, that wouldn't make any sense to say that is a genetic black people, right? That no, no, I'm going off of what you said earlier. Like, what did Abraham look like? Did he look like what are modern day Middle Easterns or more modern day Africans? He looks more like modern day Middle Easterns. Well, we got to remember the way that the Middle East looked like at that time, it was like a desert and it was it was like a warm, a tropical forest in some places. But where Abraham was by the Euphrates, we got to also know that he could have had a middle tone. He could have he most likely was not fully like 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 a super dark Ethiopian, or he most likely was not super light like someone from Iceland, but he was most likely right. a mid-tone. So I would say based upon the scriptures and based upon what we're seeing on some of the studies that he was a Hebrew, which the Hebrew branch comes from Afro-Asiatic and a lot of the Afro-Asiatics, whether they were R1B, whether they was um, e one b one b a lot of them that were centered around areas of the Levant had a slc forty five a two um mutation in them, which slc forty five a two actually contributes to darker skin pigmentation. So being in that area close to the equator in, in the middle east going down into areas of the Levant, which remember the Levant is actually on the edge or the corner of the African plate. So he would have had a darker pigmentation for the fact that he was on the African plate, that would have been something that would have made sense. So he would have had like a mid-tone. I would say something like maybe close to like some light-skinned brown person, you know, some some like maybe like a little lighter than like, I'll say, you know, like, like brown, like I'll say like a brown tone, a, like a milky brown tone, I would say. For that, especially for that environment. Now he could, he, there's he could be all types of toes. He could be darker than that. But the interesting thing is, if we follow his family tree, his family line from that, from the language column that he comes from, from those um, Hebrews, we find out that those E one B one B groups were uh, Hebrews and Arameans in those areas, and we know that the Natufians, their skin tone looked at kind of dark skin. And even their descendants to this day have high portions of dark skinned individuals. But some some of those lineages of those E groups also have light skin. We can we can find people that also develop those light skin. And that's why I also was showing E1B1A, a Jew that was found in Ashkenaz that had a light, a lighter skin tone. He looked at kind of like like Hispanic, like a like a, a dark darker tone right so, so it could have been any of these um we don't really know I, again i don't think abraham existed at all but he could have been any of these and his lineage could have gone any of these directions um and so why and th do you that's think... that's the point of pigmentation is not a representation of a people group so well, i always I'm, imitation I'm, as we know the science it's not a well, science as the point, in the, the point in here to, to make say, us a race do we have 
Well, well, the point is here is do we have any reason to think that Abraham's lineage, if it existed, went down into Africa as opposed to up yes. into like Germany? Why? Yes, because the scriptures, because the scriptures is what the scriptures is, is like a biography. And if someone wants to challenge that, we can we can clarify it by showing how the scriptures verifies almost every king of Egypt, every king of Assyria, every king of Babylon that it deals with. And when Abraham comes in, it also has what we call um, synchronisms. And Abraham, pop, and we know that he pops up during of one of the kings of Babylon called Habarabi. And what's interesting about that is we know Habarabi's law is there, Habarabi's hold. But we know that Abraham is going down. He's leaving those areas and he's going down into areas of Canaan. And he's going into areas of deeper areas of like the 13th dynasty of Egypt. And he's these lower cultures. What happens is he starts to make allegiance with the Amorites. What we start to do is use what's called the process of elimination. So we study who, who are the Kassites, who are the, many of the northern nations of that season and that time in the Bronze Age. Once we eliminate those, we start to realize that one Hablo group is not showing up as the culture that's being diverse in those times in the north. E1B1A. So E1B1A, what's interesting about it, if you look at the fossils, exactly E1B1A, especially E1B1A7, pops up in the Bronze Age, right? It's leaving areas of Egypt and it's spreading throughout different areas of Africa. It is also found today in other places in areas of Arabia and areas, especially in areas where Ur is and areas of Syria and of many places of the Levant. What's interesting so it about like, that? It seems like your argument is, is that this uh, gene marker is of a group that Abraham visited and lived in for a time. Therefore, this group is the lineage of Abraham. No, what I'm saying is that this lineage, this, the exact subgroup of this lineage, popped up in the Bronze Age, just like when Abraham had proceeded in the areas of Arabia, went to Egypt, it popped up in the Bronze Age in Africa. And it starts to develop and, and increase in the Iron Age. So that in the Iron Age, we have now have a large group of this E1B1A culture that all of a sudden popped up largely in the Iron Age. We don't see it a lot in the Neolithic Age by fossils. What we find is that some of his fossils are found in Eurasia. And what's interesting about that is that Abraham, again, he's not the first of his line. He has a father named Terah and other fathers before him that lead to Shem. That's a large family that makes groups of different nodes or clades, like Jotunites, which is a totally different clade, but from the same Shemites, from the Eberites. And what's interesting, what's, what's interesting about that, again, going from Eber to Peleg all the way down to Abraham, is that Abraham's descendants, the ones that are called Israelites directly, the clade of Israelites, they develop in the areas of Egypt, Africa, and they're sent down the Nile. And they develop in the areas of Levant and they don't pass Biblos. So in the areas of Levant, where you see going up, they don't pass Biblos until after the rise of Nebuchadnezzar and the Assyrians. And, and that's important. Until the Assyrian conquests, right? Tiglath-Pileser and the changes of ba Neo-Babylon, Neo-Babylon, right? In the Iron Age. That's when we start to see those groups go north. And we also can find evidence of Evil B1A coming north a little later because Evil B1A developed in the south in Egypt first. So it's a, it's a certain clade. This is a clade that comes from the E lineage. So the E lineage is Shemites. And we can find out if it's Shemites and we can find out the evidence that they were Shemites because of, they have different connections to Shemitic cultures. And so they're, they're, they start moving because so, of certain so invasions. This lineage originated around the same time Abraham went to Africa. Yes. But that doesn't mean it's Abraham's lineage, like because there are thousands of lineages that originate from that time period in that well, location. Well, you, you know what's interesting? Time. You know what's interesting about that? There's there was a study on the Israelites at Linkish, at the at the area of Linkish, Linkish, that was besieged by the Assyrians. And you know what they actually found out? that the skulls of the women had Negroid features. So there's a lot of studies and there's a lot of studies on those groups and they actually compare them to Egyptians. And they say that the skulls of those in the areas of those Israelites 
genetically tie to those Egyptians. And what's interesting about those Egyptians that they were con connecting to is that they were saying those Egyptians connected with Nubians. And what's interesting about that is that during the rise of the Israelites, when they had left for the Exodus, many of them kept fleeing to Egypt and they kept going into the Semitic nation of Nubia. And Nubia was very Semitic during the Iron Age and later. And that was something that was important because in between Nubia and um, or basically on the, on the sides of Nubia was Egypt and Punt, which Punt or Ab Abyssinia was a very strong nation, which also had connections to movements of Jotunites going down from Yemen into those areas, which were Shemites. And in the middle was Nubia. So in the middle of Egypt and Abyssinia was Nubia. And many of the Israelites, even in the biblical narrative, was recorded fleeing deeper into past Egypt into a nation deeper into Africa. And that's that's what's important to know is that we're connecting this group again that increased after the Neolithic um, bottleneck and would show ties in Egypt, Africa, and also would show that they would be, as we can connect with other genetic sources, connection to Israelites and the fact that they, how does that how again, does that show that any of this is connected it. to Abraham's lineage? Because they because that they literally found Israelites that were besieged by Assyrians in the Iron Age that were connected to the African groups that I just told you about. They and literally found does, Israelites. How does that show it's related to Abraham? So I mean, obviously there were a, because there were Israelites they the were because they're literally Israelites. Like it's like it's kind of like it's kind of like if I was to say. We're looking for the Spartans, right? Who are the Spartans and everything? And I literally yeah. dig up an ancient Spartan from the exact time frame that they live. That's what yeah. I'm saying. They found actual Israelites, right? How, how does that like? How would that show that that Spartan was Leonidas? It, it wouldn't, right? You'd be like, uh, it could be any of the Spartans, right? So the fact that there are Israelites doesn't mean this is a direct descendant of Abraham. You know, um, you know, you know, you're right. You know, you know, you're right. The best way to prove it would be with the scriptures. And the great thing about that is that we not only got a verification from Sennacherib's prism that those were Israelites, but we also got word for word in the book of Kings that says that the ones that were besieged in those cities were Jews. The, and, and the reason why that's important, because that city not, didn't just have the northern tribe there. It had Jews there. So that's what made it important is that that city was besieged before before the kings of Assyria reached Jerusalem. They besieged the, Syria, the, the areas of Lachish. And that's what we've seen is that they found bunches of heads, a bunch, a bunch of uh, Judean heads that were all set up by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians had set those there. And those were the Jews right before but, but, he reached remember, Jerusalem. There were, there were there were more Jews than just Abraham, right? There were, he had a fathers and grandfathers. Right, but that's other... that's talking. That's great because that's talking from Abraham, which would be the ancestral node. He would bring forth the clade of Israelites. That means it is great that we have many of them now because that's how clades work. Abraham would be a, from him would proceed the ancestral clades which would proceed even to our ta time so the clade is the group of the of the jews and that's what we found there connecting them with a pca no, saying, which is at, a principal component Abraham's study time, so i'm saying at abraham's time there was already many many jews that already existed right at abraham's and... time there was no there were there were no jews that existed at abraham's time you can't you can't no, you verify that with source because there no, were no Jews genes, at Abraham's his, time. As, as in his genes, the, the genes that got to him already existed in other lineages, right? So whatever the group you want to call, Abraham was a part of some... Right, but you group, can't, you, cannot, Jews, right? you can't sit here and tell me that there were Jews in Abraham's time, right? By because Jesus, one of the biggest whatever, things... Whatever group he's a part of, whatever group Abraham is a part of, whatever Hablo group, whatever... Yeah, um, Hablo group, there we go. So Hablo group, you're talking about Abraham, who would be a subgroup of the ancient group of DE. So his ultimate node, again, would be the Shem. And then that diverged into Shemites. So we're, mean, we're talking Jotunites, Eberites, um, people of the ancient proto uh, Ammonites before that they, they fall, or, you know, 
Right. You right. also so there's get a bunch, the a bunch of famine. lineages. There's all there's a bunch right. of lineages that come from that time period. And my question so is, the is how do you claim... identify which one of these bunch of lineages that come at that exact time period in that exact location is the Abraham one, as opposed to the other ones that are just not Abraham ones. Exactly. So that's why it's a process of elimination. Once you get, once you establish who are the genetic cassites, right? I'm sure you, you know, if you look at the, who are the genetic cassites, who are the genetic Amorites, right? These are nations that would have been there before Abraham. Who are the genetic, all the genetic, all the groups, like we we're talking proto um, Neolithic um, Bronze Age cultures. Those are the ones we want to look at and verify what are there so we can verify those are not the lineages of Abraham. And that's why I'm telling you that how, E1B1A how, 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 exactly. How do, you do that? How, do you right? that? how do you say those are not the lineages of Abraham? What is it that? Because it, cause, not... cause they exist before Abraham has Israelites' children, right? Like Abraham has many children. He has, he has, he has children of Keturah. He has children with, um, you know, the Hagar. But he has the Israelites that pop up in the Bronze Age, and those ones so, develop. So you're saying in that Africa. those particular ones have the wrong female chromosome, so they couldn't be from Abraham, something like that. Like that? No, no, no. That's, no. that's talking empty DNA, which is from mother to to mother to mother to, to daughter. That's that's a totally different topic. But again, what I'm saying is Abraham would be a lineage that would come from an ancestral node. So. His clay proceed after him, right? Because remember, Abraham, he has a, a also a nephew named Lot, and he has Ammon and Moab. So they would be genetically related to them. So they also should be E groups. And that's what we find is that we can find these E groups still in the Levant in these cultures. And one of the interesting culture ties is again looking at their ancient ties, like Natufians, right? Uh ancient Levantine culture that settled in the areas of the Levant, that grew. So we can find, yes, Abraham's ancient family that mi migrated, yes, to areas of Syria. And then by the time of Abraham, when he existed in the Bronze Age, went back down the Levant and went down into areas of Egypt, Africa. So we got to remember that it's a culture that, again, like you said, would went up to Euphrates and then went back down into Africa. And then at the Bronze Age, that node would have popped up in the Bronze Age. And E1B1A pops up in the Bronze Age, ruling in the Iron Age in areas around uh, Egypt and, and Levant and Africa. And that's the, that's the lineage that we have to look at because its line of E1B1 star groups show that they have Semitic ties to Semitic cultures. Like the 14 BC culture of the Arameans, who are Semitic culture in Alaka. And it is it is something that we can look at. We can find the Semitic Hebrew groups or Semitic groups of the Afro -Asi Asiatic groups and find out that whatever node it is that pops up, especially around like Avaris or around the time of the Israelites, that, that does it also connect to modern culture like the Canaanites and other groups like that. Those like the Amorites, the Cassites, and all that. We know that that group will be that group that popped up as the Israelites, which is E one B one A, especially E one B one A seven, E one B one A eight, the which would be the northern tribes and the southern tribes, and those are the groups that in the Iron Age start to increase and develop in those areas, especially during Solomon's time when he started working with the Phoenicians and conquering many different areas. All right. Um... I think it would help if you would formulate your argument clear without all the different technical language to try to make it easier for people to understand because a lot of people are saying they don't understand what your argument is. But we have been going for about an hour, and we do have some questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Zelensky asks, Zeleny Sok asks, why is this relevant? It, anyone can convert and become a Jew or Hebrew Israelite, regardless of ethnicity, genetics, or skin pigmentation. And two, is it okay if they mix with other ethnicities? So why is it relevant? Because it's a people's history. It's like someone saying they're ancient um, Celtic. Right? They, they find out they're Celtic and they want to hold their heritage. What I'm saying is that a lot of these people lost their heritage and it would be very healing for these people to have their heritage back. It's not hurting anyone for these people to have their heritage back. And a lot of times 
there's a racist prejudice on these people when they get into the land of Israel that they're being kicked out of that land because it's saying, well, they're, they're not Jews. And a lot of times the standard isn't based off of genetic tests and that genetic tests show that they're genetic Jews who are actually ancient genetic Jews who are, Afri who are now Africans or are developed as a large part of those Iron Age African groups, even groups that they call Bantu, that we can show that those groups had connections to Israel 2000 years ago and things like that. But um, that saying, is it okay to mix with other groups? Well, by the time, the important thing is that the reason why Israel was selected, because they was going to be a dedicated group that would follow a certain set of laws and commandments. Now, when the temple fell the first time, God forgave them and brought Ezra and told them not to mix with the nations, to the Jews only. So not, not the northern tribes but to the Jews. And that also brought division between the northern tribes like Samaria. Sometimes you hear that saying from that saying of Jesus, the good Samaritan. That's because of that separation of the Samaritans and the Jews. But there's a promise that the, the end, because then the temple fell because Messiah said they would go into captivity again to all nations. Then the temple fell and it was no longer a law that was holding them. When I'm saying a law, I'm saying the Old Testament that was holding them, but Christ that is holding them. And so that does change. Like it says, as there has been a change to the priesthood, because Messiah is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, there's also been a change to the law. So that's an important thing to understand that there's no law that's forcing Israelites or condemning Israelites if they did mix, because a lot of Israelites now did mix. So that's what I'm saying is that, yeah, many people have that admixture, but it's not a condemnation anymore from the mix but if they want to hold their heritage and stay true to their heritage and they're not like trying to fight or and one of the biggest things i also want to address is that i don't believe the hate doctrine i don't believe that's there's a lot of things that i talk about on my page one of the biggest things i talk about is that we can find out the heritage of these people without um causing divisions within other people's heritages so i guess that's you know, it's, it's their choice of the mixing and all that. Gotcha. Uh, Raphael Amawan asks, who is salvation for? Salvation is, as the scripture says, when Messiah popped up, he says salvation is from the Jews. But salvation is for the world. How do we know? Because the scripture says, look to me, and the Old Testament says, look to me and be you saved. All the ends of the earth. So all the ends of the earth are actually welcome to come to his salvation. Because even in Isaiah, he says in another place that his altar shall be an uh, altar for everyone, right? Uh, so the prayers of other nations will be accepted. But what he wants is righteousness first, because even he punished Israelites, right? He judged, he judged even his own people. So God is, is not a God of, uh, he doesn't uh, put any favors or he doesn't put someone over someone because they're born a certain way. but Salvation is for anyone who finds righteousness to be born again. Gotcha. Uh, next question is from Max Rose. Please ask him what religion Ashkenazi Jews should follow. Christ. The every every group in the world should follow Christ. Every single group, and that's one of the biggest things that Yeshua Hamashiach is the only way to salvation. Period. Is that they should follow Christ because when it comes down to bloodline, them claiming to be Jews. A lot of them are not Jews. So Christ, like Jesus Christ, that are correct? Yes, Jesus, Jesus yeah. Christ. All right. Uh, Outback asks, apologies if you have asked this already, but ask Lion Farm about polytheism in ancient Israel culture found in archaeology. What is his response to this? So we know that as early as the transition of the Bronze Age and Iron Age, there is found in the Israelite culture that they did get into some of the bell worship and which is monotheism and all that. And, uh, and that, I mean, polytheism and all that. But when the Israelites decided to go into monotheism or just one God instead of the polytheism with the multiple gods, that's when they was leaving the Exodus. But even God witnessed in the Exodus, the writings of the Exodus, that they were do polytheism even at the, in the um, desert. They were not only worshiping God, they started worshiping Baal. They started making crap images and stuff. And not only that, in the writing, as soon as they got to the lands of Israel, they start worshiping Baal. And they were taken by some of the nations of 
the first captivity, their first captivity in the book of Judges is by some of the nations of um, Euphrates. The groups of Euphrates basically took them because they were worshiping Baal worshipers in Canaan. So that, that was one of the biggest things with Israel is that they constantly was messing up, but that's what they need, the Messiah. Gotcha. Uh, Nico Blasks, ask him, when was the Bronze Age and the Iron Age? What are the hard dates? So when is the Bronze Age and Iron Age? That's such a question because it all depends wh what are we talking about. Are we talking about Bronze Age, Iron Age in Europe or Bronze Age, Iron Age in Africa? They say, this is controversial, but they say Bronze Age, Iron Age in Africa was sooner than in Europe. So they say, say the Bronze Age or the Iron Age in Africa was sooner. But that's because they look at that Bantu culture. That's why you got to be careful looking at that Bantu culture. Because that Bantu culture actually is that group that left from Egypt. Because that's where iron actually came from, from Egypt. Going in deeper into areas of Africa. So it all depends on when they first started to pick up iron. Which, again, it depends on what time, what um, region we're talking about. Gotcha. Uh, 60 Second Skeptic asks, if you discovered you were not the genetic background you think you are, would you change your religious beliefs in any way? Well, if, if I discovered that I'm not R1B and maybe find out I'm E1B1A, that would be great because then I'd be amazed because that would be ancient Israelites. But my line is what I believe to be an unbiased line for me. And that's a line that actually works out for, for my case because I'm just trying to establish the fact that there are ancient Israelites and that if it so happens that somehow I mixed in by whatever process it was, then amen. But if somehow I'm not that, amen too, because I believe by faith. So that's, there's nothing that could change faith that would be a physical force um, because faith is established by um, the writings itself. Gotcha. Uh, Blow Me Up 2 Day asked, who was the first Jew? The first, the first ever Jew. Now, because we got to understand what a Jew is. The Jew, a Jew is the process of the groups that came together and lived in Jerusalem and would call themselves residents of Judah. So a Jew, even though the breakdown, the Strong's word of Jew, it wouldn't actually be said like Jew. It has a, a little different um, way of saying it. But pretty much, long story short, the definition of Jew would be a residence of Jerusalem. That's why Benjamin, um, tribes of Benjamin, Levi, and Judah were all groups of Jews. So technically a Jew would be all those that had joined with Judah, which would be with David. So that would be in a sense of when the Jews or the sense of a Jew starts to, in the phrase, pop up versus just being an Israelite. So... Gotcha. Ball Diablo asked, is he saying that Jew bones were of African structure slash build or what? You said were the Jew bones of actual African structure and build? Yeah, you were talking about how the skulls and things had African uh looked African or something. There was something about that. Yeah, um, um on Lion Farm, if you type Lion Farm DNA, we talk a lot about the finds. Maybe I'll talk about it a little later today. Um, I talked about the sources, the sources directly out, and this, I kid you not, word for word says that the, the Jews that were examined after the siege of Assyria say that they had, by looking at their bone structure, had African uh, African nose, uh, African um, structure. They, they could tell just, just by the nose. And they also could tell from the designs by the Assyrians um, when they besieged uh, Linkish, Lakish, and they put the depictions of the Jews with their depictions. This is something worth checking out. And also, one of the most important things about the structure of the, the African admixture, the African structure of the Jews, is that we can find the connections in history. So that the connection with history and the places where they're found. So. If you want to see like the the word for word reading of it, I'll I'll read some of that maybe sometime this week. Um, Blow me up. Asks who was Judah from? Judah was from, as we know, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob received the, the blessing name of Israel. So Judah came from the one who is the last one, uh, Jacob, Israel. So Judah will be right from him. 
Gotcha. Um, Blow Me also asks, so Jacob wasn't a Jew? Jacob himself would not technically be a Jew because a Jew technically, because someone would say, yeah, a Jew would come from Jacob, but Jacob himself wouldn't be called a Jew because a Jew would, would be a resident of Jerusalem and they haven't yet entered into Jerusalem to separate themselves from the other tribes. Because also the important thing about a Jew is that a Jew would be considered not the other 10 tribes of Israel. So the Jews would technically be Benjamin, Judah, and Levi that separate themselves from the northern tribes of Israel. So the term, especially when we look at the scripture, the term Jew only pops up in the Iron Age. Gotcha. Um, Rafahan Amawan asks, who are the Israelites today? The Israelites today is what they are. They're, they're going to be exactly the Y chromosome of E1B1A. They're going to also be from the female lines of L and mainly L2 and L3 that had came together after the Neolithic time frame and had developed into a Bronze Age and Iron Age culture. Those are going to be the original ancient Israelites. There's also going to be groups that mix in with them. For reference, look at the genetic results of Santome e Principe Jew, Jewish groups that has settled there. He also asked, does God hate? Um, God, he hates evil. So he hates those that hate their brothers. So that's why you will see like places that say, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. That reference was because Esau hated Jacob. And if he killed Jacob, he also would have basically destroyed the way for the Messiah to also be per, per, brought forth. And also the blessing that was on um, Jacob. And that was one of the biggest things that Esau became like a stranger because he lost his birthright. And that's what was the saying is that the Lord hates strangers that hate those who are his children or hate him. So the Lord does not put forth um, anything towards the dead. Like, for example, the scripture Messiah says God is, is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. So who he hates is the dead. So that's why Messiah says those who are baptized are saved and those who are not, they're basically dead and they're, they're already in condemnation. So that will be the explanation for that is that if one was to be dead and continuing in, in death, it doesn't mean that he doesn't offer a way for them to be saved, but it means that they have chosen a way of death and he hates death. Gotcha. Um, Molasses asks, why is there no archaeological, uh, cultural or other evidence of Jews in the regions right. he claims? Um, which, 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 which reason Re regions? Sorry. That's a good question. Uh, so, Molasses, if you're still in the chat, uh, please let us know. Uh, Ball asks, if they're so upset about losing their cultural heritage, why aren't they learning the language? I, I imagine he means Hebrew. Well, yeah, they're obviously learning Hebrew. Like, for example, the Jew, the, the black Jews in Diomi are learning Hebrew. So by saying they're not learning their language, Hebrew is actually modern Hebrew is not ancient but Hebrew. So it's also a... Uh, it's also the sense of that it's lost. Like the language is almost in a way lost. So they would actually have to bow down in a way and learn modern Hebrew and then build their way up to learn ancient Hebrew. Unless someone self teaches themselves ancient Hebrew or um, gives a private tutor for studying ancient Hebrew, which is not, if you notice, not a lot of people who are actually of African descent have such privileges and stuff like that. It's something that's important to know. Not, and I'm not saying that none of them are rich or none of them have money, but it's not something that people say, well, my life is going so well, I might as well just learn some Hebrew and learn my heritage, right? A lot of people have lost their heritage. They don't even know who they are, but the ones who find out who they are or that return to places like Israel, like Naomi, the Israelites in Naomi, they are picking up their ancient heritage and returning to their roots, just like many Jews in Africa. So there's a lot, actually a lot, uh, Molasses uh, responded, the Nubian African regions that you were talking about is where you said that there's no... Oh, in, nu in Nubia? Yeah. So, again, in Nubia, right, we got to understand that those ones pop up at the Iron Age. So, there, there's no E1B1A there before the Iron Age. So, that's one of the biggest things that fossils. So, yeah, they do pop up after the Iron Age. And that's what, that's what that was the point, is that 
as Israelites fled into Egypt, they went into Nubia, and that would be via Iron Age. F fossils? Fossils take 10,000 years to form. Fossils? What do you mean by fossils there? Say, say it one more time. Uh, you, you said we can use fossils. Fossils take 10,000 years to form, so I don't think it was fossils. What do you mean by fossils? Well, fossil, there's, there's, we can have fossils that were only formed within the last 100 years or 1,000 years. Um, mm. But we do have like ancient fossils. So when we're talking fo like fossil record, like for example, if we're saying fossils, we're talking about a culture that was buried within its time frame and the layer of its time frame. Like, or you just you just mean archaeological evidence? Like a fossil is specifically like a biological structure that became stone over time. It takes a minimum of ten thousand years. But you just mean archaeological data, archaeological finds? Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. That's I guess we'll, we'll just say that. That's that's better. That's that's make it scientific. Gotcha. Um, archaeological data. Bloviator bomber asks, "Why should we believe the Bible is true? Why shouldn't wait? Wait. Why shouldn't we believe, or why should we believe? Why should we believe? Oh, why should we? So." The reason why we should believe the Bible is true is because it's, it's not putting itself out as an ascent to, it's not, first, it, its premise is earth-based. It's not saying that they're from planet Nublion from thousands of years of this, this, and that. It's, it's talking like, it's coming in a sense of something logical. It's popping up in the Bronze Age. It's telling you about real cultures, real places, real people that's going through these very hard things, that's having real children that are, these children are developing into this very special special cultures. Even the fact that the Bible told us about the Hittites before the world knew about the Hittites. And before the 1800s, 1700s, they never knew about the Hittites. But the Bible told us about the Hittite culture and then they discovered, and they were saying, oh, the Bible's a lie, they, there, there's no Hittites. All of a sudden they discovered the Hittites and they find out that, yeah, the Bible is telling the truth. It's a book that's written in, its, in a very timely manner even the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament is very real. And you can look at it almost with a scalpel and go about it with surgical precision and find out that it's all exactly at its time. So it's not a book that's trying to lie or hide anything. It's a book that's telling you real things and real events and just giving, you, giving it to you straight forward and saying, this is the way to be saved. As we know, we all are dirt, all going to die. But the only way to be saved is this way. So, and even the fact that good things came from it, like hospitals, the hospital, the original way of the hospital. I'm not talking about the dream hospitals of the Greeks. Talk about the real hospital that we see today. That's a that's something that came from Christ, from the Christians. So it has a great foundation and a great. It has great motives and it has great causes that it does. That's why I say it's worth believing because it's the best thing for mankind. All right. Um, uh, Blow Me Up asks, so you believe in genetics? Do you believe in evolution? No, because the, the, most, the most interesting thing when you look at genetics, you'll notice something interesting that happens is that all, all genetic constantly go to what is called mutations or they constantly degrade. But we don't see all of a sudden something gets more information and becomes something um, evolved or something new. I don't know believe genetic um, um, families. I believe that there are certain kinds of families that constantly make their same kind. And we get these different kinds that we see later on, the diversity that we see from different nodes and clades. Gotcha. And uh, last question. If M Mosik, Moses and Abraham did not exist, if the Exodus didn't happen, would that prove your religious beliefs incorrect? Um, it couldn't, that couldn't be, it's, it's kind of like saying someone, if the twin towers never fell, because we already verified the Exodus, there's Egyptologist by the name of uh, Frank, um, I'm going to say it's Dr. Frank, and he's an Egyptologist that actually did a hand-to-hand -hand breakdown of the Israelites leaving the av Avaris, and now there's a lot of people that's talking about this evidence because it's very compelling, and if someone never seen that evidence and they think, they never, they, they, it's, you know, a generation that's born today may never know or may not heard that somehow in a couple minutes, 
um, two towers fell by two planes, right? And they may say, oh, how can two, two, two towers fall by two planes in a couple minutes? Yet it happened. And we know that that's something that happened. So, so the exodus is something like that, that it may sound mystical, right? That all of a sudden this nation of, um, remember, also Egypt was doing witchcraft and stuff. So this nation of, of people who are working with witchcraft and stuff were also plagued by some of the things that they couldn't even control. And, and obviously, if you look at some of the writings that they had, even in Egypt, they expressed that that was a group that was there, a Semitic group that was there, and then they left, they went to ex ex Exodus, and then all of a sudden you see writings like by Merneptah, the Merneptah Stele, that writes that e Israel popped up, that they first write about Israel and then the later pro processes of that. So the, the, Exodus, the Exodus is confirmed. Um, well, I think we the consensus that among that. all historians, including the Israeli historians, is that it, it, it's, there's no evidence to support it. There's all the evidence indicates it's false. But my question is more generally, if it's shown to be false, would that prove your religious beliefs incorrect? Well, my question, my question would be for that question, have they looked into the evidence of Dr. Falk's um, evidence? Yes. Um, um, but more general question, just if it's shown to be false, would that disprove your religious beliefs? Not specifically about has it shown been shown to be false. If it was shown to be false, would that and again, stop believing? Again, the reason why I say this is like saying if the if the if 9-11 was proven to be false, if 9-11 was proven to be false, uh, would you still believe this, this, or that? You know, it's, it's trying to discredit something I already seen. No, I already seen the evidence. I've seen that the, everything's valid. I'm talking valid. If he hasn't seen that video, it'll verify it. So it, you can't debunk something that's confirmed. And absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. So they have to, what they'll be doing is trying to put an absence of evidence argument. But we already have the evidence. So absence of evidence won't equate or defeat the evidence. So well, actually, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. So for example, if I said, there is no water in my cup, and then I show you my cup and you don't see any water, the absence of evidence of water is evidence of the absence of water. So ab absence of evidence can be. But that's that's not what, when people say absence of evidence, that's not what they mean for that argument. When they say absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, that's saying that, hey, this is not here, therefore it is evident that it is not there, therefore it didn't happen. That's what they mean by absence of evidence, is that they're using the absence of evidence as evidence of absence. That's what's important. Right, so like if there was water in the cup, you'd expect there to be dew Right, but that's a, different, that's a different argument for well, absence how of evidence. This, evidence how this applies to the exodus is that if there was a group of at minimum half a million people who traveled from Egypt to Jerusalem, then we would expect to see homesteads, uh, pots. Yeah, we, and we do see that. We, 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 and that's what I'm saying. If you haven't seen the no, no, video no, no. by so, Dr. So Fowl, he literally goes over all those pieces of, I have, I'm saying, I have, I have seen it. ceramic it's, evidence. It's but, but so we can look at the archaeological evidence of the time frame of the promised land and see the amount of homesteads that grew from before to after the exodus over a period of two to 5,000 years. And at, at none of that is a substantial population growth ever um, in that time period. Not to mention that the population of the uh, slaves of Egypt, if they were that large, would make up over six. You're talking about in a, in a virus? You talk about, you talk about the Semitic Moses. groups that had a massive explosion in a virus. We have no evidence of that. Um, we have no evidence of slaves leaving Egypt and then settling in uh, Israel in that time period. No, there's zero evidence of that. Okay, so maybe we'll do another video and I'll show you all that evidence because we actually have evidence of a virus emptying, empty, emptying out, right? A virus becoming empty. And then all of a sudden, writings of the Egyptians, of Israelites, now out of a virus in Israel, in the land of Israel, and the, and the movements of the conquest of, of Joseph, I mean, I just, um, I don't know how I keep getting his name twisted. Uh, obviously, um, right, Moses' right hand man, right? Not Joseph, but Joshua. Joshua. In the movements of Joshua, Joshua's movements, and even the kings that were pinpoint illustrated, they 
fall exactly at the time when the as soon as the Israelites pop up in the land. And and we can go that we can go to that process piece by piece, and I can show you how all that evidence is actually showed, and and that the fact that the residents of those Semitic groups, right, because they're Shemites, they're they're Hebrew pottery being made in the lands of Avaris, and then all of a sudden it, you pop it, it pops up in the lands of Israel. And we can we can connect those things, and we can show that those were those groups that built. Um, P. Ramses and the cities that are mentioned in the Exodus that says they built those cities of Ramses in the lands of of Egypt. So that's that's we we can look at that. We can look at all those um, material evidences, and we can verify sure. that the Israelites were there. Okay, sure. I have a few archaeologist experts who are PhDs in the field who can definitely. Uh... We can talk about this with that would be fun. Um, but we haven't been yeah. for about an hour and a half. It was a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Do you want to give any links or references where people can find more about your work? Um, yeah, if if you if you I don't have any other um, sources um, or other connection uh, platform, but if you want to learn a little bit more on African Israelites, definitely check out my channel on Lion Farm. Just looking at DNA, so you can put Lion Farm DNA and it should pop up on YouTube and. You know, I just like what you're doing here, which is great, having different conversations on these different um, ideas and, you know, looking at the complexity of it all. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too.